that music. Party's not a party's a man who fights crime And we're gonna watch him fight for a minute at a time With John and Will and I guess you just rhyme It's Bad Minute! Attention, citizens of Fair Gotham Welcome once more to Bat Minute and Robin The show that will always be there to catch you when you fall or at least I will. Now I'll let you drop. <laughs> I am one of your hosts, John Parker. And I am the co-host of this endeavour. And quite well, it seems. It's me, <laughs> Niall McGowan. Rejoice. <laughs> this is like trying to break away from doing the Alfred voice there. I was like, oh my God, it's taken <laughs> over. No, you've got to do it for the whole episode. Oh, and you should have come. He should burst in and say, good news, everyone. <laughs> but uh, we uh, are joined, as always. By a very special guest. It is a returning guest. It is the one, the only, Darren Houston. Hello. Hey. Uh, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, this is a, I mean, as Gandalf said to some hobbit before they're about to be killed, uh, this is the end of all things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Although, Darren, usually you're, you're like a, we always give you, you made the mistake in the first year of saying you don't mind doing end credits minutes, <laughs> which just meant they're like, oh, we're always going to have to give you end credits minutes. And then uh, specifically remember last year, you're like, well, I did do a movies by minutes about Clueless. I would like to, you know, get an Alicia Silverstone minute. So I was like, all yeah. right, we'll give you one of the last minutes of the movie then that just happens to feature Alicia Silverstone. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It's an excuse to just talk about her in general. To yeah, be yeah. Yeah. And I did send you, like, she got onto TikTok, like, sometime last year uh, at the urging of her child that she used to baby bird feed uh, by chewing up his food and spitting into his mouth. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was a, that was a topic that was part of uh, As If, where people, like, we did the, like a, a minute with all the hosts before we started, and uh, that was a, a thing that came up as a subject. That, that was something she was known for. Um, oh. And she got onto TikTok, and it was mostly her son, Bear, who was, you know, kind of running the account. Um, and then there was one video where she correct, like, you know, it's like, what do people call you? And she kind of corrected the spell, the, the, how you say a name. And I think you guys have already recorded some episodes. I'm like, oops. Uh, yeah, but, the, there is also yeah. the, throughout the season one point going, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we still get it wrong. Oh, yeah. 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 I so, mean, for many years before we'd heard her actually say it, and she was merely a girl who appeared in a few Aerosmith videos, everyone called her Alicia. So, like, mm. you know. For Alicia, you know, like yeah, people yeah. said her name yeah, wrong, yeah. so you know. But uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's weird because like this is literally the first Batman film that I saw at the cinema. <clears throat> I missed out on seeing eighty nine, even though I was twelve the day it came out over here, uh, and oh, obviously it was the first perfect. twelve certificate. Yeah, um, and then uh, Batman Returns. Uh, the only film I saw the year that that came out at the cinema was. Uh, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. That was it. <laughs> that was the other film. I didn't really see any oh. other films that year, so I I didn't I didn't see Batman Returns at the cinema. Um, and then Batman Forever came out uh, the the summer when I turned eighteen. Um, I've got like the fourth or fifth issue of SFX magazine, which is still going. Um, oh, over that, here. Be, that might be worth money. But then I, again, it's hard to predict these things. Now. <laughs> yeah, and that's got that's got the Riddler on the front. Um, so, you know, and obviously there were some interviews in there about it. Um, but I, I wasn't really going to the cinema until like the end of that year. Mm. Um, so, you know, I missed seeing that at the cinema. Um, and so I, you know, in 96, I, you know, I saw a few films and then uh, 97, cause our local cinema was closed, but you know, I'd seen, um, I think Men in Black. Allow me, allow me to check my records. Good uh, very briefly. You, you've got a record. <laughs> yeah, if I if I move out of the shop, I don't know if you can. It's not letting me see it. I've got a I've got a, a book that has. Can you see it there? Oh. Says, oh yeah yeah. Yeah, ninety six to two thousand twelve. Um yeah, so in ninety six I did see some good films. I saw Seven, Heat, Toy Story, Train Spotting, Twelve Monkeys. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a pretty good year. And then I saw Men in Black. Uh, and then I saw this. Uh, and then I saw Jurassic Park, The Lost World. That was like my summer. Uh, mm, that sounds like my summer. <laughs> yeah. And um, I went with a friend to the other two, but this film I went alone <laughs> because I no. couldn't get anyone to go. And it came out like literally 
the week of my birthday that year. So I was like, Ooh. you know, I'm going to well, What well, a birthday it. treat for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But nobody, normally for my birthday, I can convince people to come to the cinema to see whatever we're going to see. Like, it's not that hard. But in this case, like, nobody wanted to come and see it. I think it had already been out in America. Was it out in America in, like, June or something? End of June? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. 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 So it already had, like, a lot of bad press before it got over here. Um, mm. You know, and I'm sure if I could, I could bothered, I could go over and find my copy of Empire that probably came out that month, hyping it up and putting it on the front cover, and <laughs> you know. But a lot of the talk was more of like, oh, they got Arnold like you know a half a million dollar Hummer and a twenty million dollar jet for it or whatever. Actually, he might mm. have got the jet for, for True Lies, but like it was just what he was getting paid it was like the big thing and he like deliberately managed he like i think he got paid like 25 million because he wanted to be paid more than everybody else who'd been getting paid 20 yeah. million for doing films i think there was a a thing as well where like the year previous it would have been jim carrey set the record for getting 20 million for the cable guy yeah and like, it was like the highest that any actor had been paid at that point and then it just became like a like oh no 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 like everyone's pushing that out of the way now so arnie's gonna up that to 25 million for for this yeah. and the, it just goes goes up spirals out of control at that point <laughs> but then i've seen every batman film at the cinema since yeah. this was the and then uh, a couple of years ago they did like the 20th or 30th i was about to say 20th no 30th anniversary of, the, of batman 89 um and they did a double bill at cineworld where they did batman and batman returns together so you could just you know get the tickets yeah, uh, and then they just like put the both on the same screen, you know, with like a gap in the middle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the but only what, what... the only Batman film since 1989 that I have not seen at the cinema is Batman Forever. That's the only one there. Yeah, I've seen everything yeah. else. Oh. Well, what's your uh, what was the verdict on this when you went to see it then? Well, the... oh, and also, what's the verdict now? They can be two different things. Well, I, the, I think the issue was I'd seen Men in Black like a couple of weeks before, and Men in Black is almost a perfect film <laughs> like, yeah, the, yeah. like it's yeah. such a good film um and then when i saw this you know obviously you know through my love for alicia i was like i'll sit through it you know and obviously we'd heard the stories about her being bullied on set and all that kind of thing so i was like you know i'll go show some support and then at the end i was like that was just one of the worst films i've ever seen <laughs> and at that point Aww. i hadn't seen that many films um you know i'd only seen seven films the year before and I, that was only the second film i'd seen that year but i was like and i saw spice world that year as well um <laughs> and i, I that's say that's one of those that spice i hated Worlds. at the time but now i like oh i really i mean i loved spice world you know uh like i mean i've, I've got it on vhs in like a tin with victoria on the hey. front uh yeah so you know i'm i'm a huge fan of spice world um you know there's some solid gags in that film yeah. um but you know I mean, in a year when you when I also saw like the game and Austin Powers, mm. like I mean, I guess the only thing that kind of is in the same area would be like Alien Resurrection and I know what you did last summer, but I enjoy I know what you did last summer. I've watched it more than once, you mm. know, <laughs> mostly for the ladies with three names um, that are in that, you know. Well, it was a huge movie though. Like I remember yeah. everybody being into it at the time. Yeah. Mm. I, it just it just feels like the blocking is all off the like the angles make no sense just in this one minute but like that's how it felt for the whole film like you know and people obviously these days they remember like the hilarious puns from Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, but none of those were funny I don't remember laughing at any of them in the cinema like <laughs> I like them because they're not funny like yeah a dad I mean joke. yeah I mean there is like you know we've obviously entered the the kind of time where there is a certain level of like irony in things that aren't funny. Yeah, being funny because they're trying to be funny but they're not funny like this is you know there's a level of that that kind of sort of works in some films um, but in this case it's you know they just weren't funny I was like I just like the whole performance you know, I know that you know Joel Schumacher uh, R.I.P you know I know he is a good director he can he can direct things well like you know I'll rewatch Falling Down every couple of years because hell yes it's it's such a like it's such a well directed film like it like the way it escalates throughout the whole thing you know and Michael Keaton's you know I'm the bad guy like it's just like it's it's perfectly done um and then I don't know I don't like I don't know what he was taking while he was doing this <laughs> so this is minute 119 uh, I suppose this is actually the perfect time though because we can we can delve in. The minute starts with uh, good old Babs awakening to her favourite relative, and it ends with her ditching school forever. Yeah, what school's we all dreamed of. Out 
Four. Four. Batgirl. Ever. <laughs> ah, for <laughs> Batman forever. <laughs> Even better. Well, I should have um, uh, an update, John. I told you briefly in the green room. But uh, we mentioned there last minute, we were like, what is this book she's reading? We, like, no one could make it out. And I was joking, saying, oh, it would be great if it was Emma by Jane Austen or something. That would be a nice little reference. Or, like, you know, it could be, like... Wait, you know, is it? Is no, it? no, it's not. No, no. Oh. <laughs> but I kind of wish it was, like, Miss Radical Orphans Monthly or something. Or it could be Gotham Beat. They could have had, like, that issue of Gotham Beat from Batman Forever with Val Kilmer's face just... <laughs> It's really... No, Niall, Gotham Beat is our other podcast. She can't read a podcast. <laughs> or it could be great. It's, like, it's that cover. Of, it's the same cover of Gotham Beat, but it got George Clooney on it. And it's like how Bruce Wayne's haircuts changed his whole appearance or something. Uh, but no, no, actually managed to Blade Runner level, you know, zoom in, enhance. And I screenshotted it. And I went in and I you know, heightened the brightness and the contrast. And I got this, this, blah, blah, blah. And eventually... I sussed out what this title is. Quotations from Chairman Mao. <laughs> yes, that's exactly Yay. what it is. <laughs> She's going to lead the great <laughs> bat communist party. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, no, this is actually the Waverly novels by oh. Sir Walter Scott. Uh, uh, basically, the I don't know. Do you guys know the Waverly novels at all? I know the words Sir Walter Scott. I didn't know uh, that I know the novels. I know the title. It's, um, well, it's, of course, it's novelizations of the hit TV show, Wizards of Waverly Place. Uh, of course. No, no, it's not. <laughs> it's uh, apparently back in like the 17th, 18th century, they were like the most widely read popular literature at the time. And in a kind of Stephen King, Richard Bachman-esque move, Walter Scott was known as like a poet, like, you know, a famous poet at the time. And I, th- I don't know if he felt that apparently no one's figured out exactly why he never claimed credits. But uh, he just, like, he, I don't know if he just thought they were beneath him or he didn't want his name associated with, like, pop, you know, literature or whatever. But uh, eventually then he went, like, destitute in 1826, and then he claimed credits. <laughs> and then it was, like, I guess, maybe to reap in more benefits of having been the guy who wrote. Because there was then, there was originally Waverly, and then there was, a, like, 20 other books, most of them unrelated, but they were always kind of promoted under, like, from the author of Waverly. And it includes Rob Roy. You know, famous adapted into a movie starring Liam Neeson. Oh all. wait, you mean Rob Roy, like the 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 historical character? Yeah, say character. Yeah. The, the the historical figure. Oh, the whole thing. That's, uh, I I can kind of understand why she's reading it because it's all chivalrous knights doing heroic deeds, but they're they're Scottish. All all of them are Scottish. Uh, one of them is also, and this is the thing I'm wondering: like, if this was deliberate, that's genius. But I I'm feeling it probably wasn't. But like I can, we can hope, we can hope because one of the other books uh, is Ivanhoe, uh, you know the famous story of a boy and his tool. And uh, the thing is, Ivanhoe was adapted into a movie in 1951, and that movie starred one George Sanders, who was the first ever actor to play Mister Freeze. Oh so, my God, that that's too much of a coincidence. Come on, like, that, that was it could be they were like, what's a book about knights? Uh, Waverly novels. Yeah, go ahead and just chuck that on her chest, and that was the end of it. But like, I don't, you know, it, it it's it's a really good coincidence if that's a coincidence though. That's like that's you know that's beautiful. But it, it, it ties because remember we had the whole thing about like the whole concept of poison ivy is borrowed from Rappaccini's daughter. And yeah. then they adapted that into a movie, and it starred Eli Wallach, who also played Mister Free. Like this, all these kind of things are like, oh my god, this thing, this everything truly is connected. But it is fate. That one, I can imagine, just been coincidence. This one feels like just blow up. These, these are Hollywood guys. Joel Schumacher knows old. He knows old Hollywood. He'd probably be but, like, oh yeah, the guy who played Mister Freeze was in one of these books. Oh yeah, he was old. At the same time, it kind of goes against what we were talking about before because. That shows a level of care yeah. put into the movie. <laughs> it feels like Alicia Silverstone just walked up to a bookcase and picked off the first book that was at her height, and then yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> that'll that do. Yeah. Well, the, also because I cover don't her think... up as if she's intelligent. It has to be thick enough so her, her character looks intelligent. <laughs> mm. um, That's the thing that confused me, though. Is like, okay, she's meant to be intelligent. She's meant to be smart. But does it fit the character, her person, to be reading that book? Because at at heart, she's a kind of um, rebellious, thrill-seeking kind of character. 
And it could be that that's all that Bruce has in the house. <laughs> yeah, what have you got, yeah. Bruce? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Unless I you mean, think Dick would have other stuff, though. She could borrow, like, magazines or, like, you know, other books from him. <laughs> but I feel yeah, she, like, she should be reading a novelization of uh, Gleam in the Cube, you know, like... That's that's the level I feel that they should be at is the yeah, novelization of some sense. film, you know, like that's what that's what Dick that's what Dick would have. It, I don't think I don't think Dick has got any book that he's leather bound. Yeah, um, no, he's know, not like Howard the Duck novelization. Yeah, the novelization <laughs> yeah. of Brain Scan. Oh, it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, um, the novelization of The Shining. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God! Does that exist? Please tell me that exists. I don't know if it exists. I that, really hope that, that has does. that has happened in the past. I'm almost uh, certain yeah. there was a novelization of Clueless. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, so there, there have been novelizations of novels that have already been adapted into books. The Red of the Shining is like it's that different a movie to the to the book. You could adapt yeah. it to be like, well, you know, it's a different story, I guess. But, well, not a different wow. story. It's fundamentally the same story, but it's like, <laughs> you know, different filter altogether. But there, there was a moment earlier in the movie where Alfred was reading Oliver Twist to Bruce when he was a kid. And it could be like, maybe they're like, well, maybe Alfred read this to her when she was like a little girl or something. And she's reading it now to kind of, to you know, evoke the memory of Alfred or something. But I think it might have been just like. She's just, you know, sitting around this grand manner. There's no TV, even though freaking we knew from Batman Returns, Bruce Wayne, he has a TV. We saw him watching it all the goddamn time. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, it could be just in the living room. It was like, oh, uh, I don't know. Maybe she just, she couldn't sleep and she wanted to pick up the most boring looking book that was there. And like, the Waverly novels, Ivanhoe. All right. <laughs> this is good. If nothing, if anything will cock me out, it'll be this. But it did also get me thinking of uh, something... We have yet to bring up this season. I imagine you must be familiar with it, uh, Darren. Um, Monty Silverstone, Alicia's dad, uh, of amongst his many jobs, uh, he is also a novelist. I wasn't aware of that. I don't think in Clueless we ever got into what her dad did. Yeah, oh, everything about... Um, Everything about Monty Silverstone <laughs> strikes me as very, very dodgy. <laughs> like, <laughs> specifically, too, I think, because he still lives in London. And, the, you know, the whole family, except for Alicia, lives in London. I, I feel like she's almost, like, distanced herself as, like, I'm a legitimate person. Everything about him is, like, he started off, oh, every, you know, sort of blurb you read about his life seems like it was written by him to over-romanticize himself and make him sound like the most impressive man in the world <laughs> when it all sounds a bit like... Eh, that, you know, he owned a helicopter rental place and then he owned a horse. Then he wrote a book about how to, you know, never lose at, <laughs> at betting on horse races and stuff. And apparently Alicia grew up at the track because he was there doing research for it all the time. I was like, he seems like a bit of a, a bit sleazy, basically. Not helped by uh, his book, Forever Lasts Till Dawn, um, which if you look at the cover... It's just like stock models, and it looks like it's like a lesbian romance <laughs> drama, basically. Okay. Uh, and um, it's basically it's like one of these tawdry kind of. Well, there's like here's a a brief blurb about what happens in it. Okay, so in the marketplace of a small Ukrainian village, two beauties dance. They dance because poverty gives them no choice. Dancing is the only way they can supplement their parents' pitiful wages. Dancing draws attention when you're beautiful. Not all of it is welcome. Drawn into a web of deceit, rape, and tyranny, the girls flee to the Ukraine, seeking a new life in 1904 London. Fleeing the country of their birth, they board a ship bound for England. They encounter trouble on board from an overzealous doctor. And then it basically goes on to just describe every event that's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, it's all it, just like they eventually end up having to dance in the street again, and they just come. They run afoul of men constantly, and it's it just and it, like um, one of the reviews notes that uh, the story has a mixture of erotic scenes, violence, and tyranny. Uh, I mean, that makes it sound good. <laughs> I mean, is the doctor overzealous because he like overprescribes a you know paracetamol or something? Like, what's going yeah. on there? Why Take ten a day. Yeah. Um, I mean, when when Monty Silverson was like renting helicopters, did he in, at any point take place in the uh, the Catalina wine mixer? Did he ever get involved in that? 
<laughs> not that I'm aware of, but you no, know, no, that's a pity. The... He missed a chance. We all <laughs> yeah. know. We all know the Catalina wine mixer is the event of the year. Mm. Um, but um, but there's a lot of like if you go on the Goodreads because one thing they mentioned that he wrote another book called The ABCs of Racing: How to Not Lose at Horse Racing. And yeah. I can't find any other evidence that that book exists. I don't know if it was banned or something, but I it's mean, just like... I think I could shed light on what the book will tell you, which is uh, don't bet on horses. That's how you don't lose money on horses. I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's a reason that the uh, the companies in charge of the gambling yeah. make so much money. Yeah, own, own a, a horse track. System. Yeah. <laughs> own a horse track. That's pretty much the only way I think to make yeah. money off of... Um, yeah. But well, if you go I mean, on uh, Goodreads for um, Forever Last Sold On, there's like seven reviews. Most of, most of them are like four or five star, but most of them also have the sentence at the bottom, I was given this book by Monty Silverstone <laughs> for my to gauge my opinion. No other compensation was given, uh, which makes it sound like there probably was other compensation. <laughs> and then one of the reviews is from Monty Silverstone himself. Which is... Hey, I reviewed our podcast myself on iTunes. It's fine. <laughs> uh, but then there's a couple. Of, there is one that's one star that goes on about this, like how awful. Uh, and then there was one great review that was like, um, there were, however, several things that bugged me all the way through the book. At times, the writing seems almost childlike, with no attempt to add emotional buildup, drama, or suspense. For example, when fairly important characters are involved in accidents and end up in hospital. They are likely to be dead within a couple of paragraphs. This almost childlike style continues in the descriptions of famous monuments, which sometimes sound like something out of a school textbook. Uh, like they walk past like, Number 10 Downing Street, the home of the Prime Minister, which doesn't need pointing out. Uh, <laughs> other geographicals are totally wrong. Like after taking a ferry from Dover to Calais, they return via Bordeaux, which is nonsensical. And other French uh, place names are completely misspelt. <laughs> uh, the frequent brief references to historical events that have no relation to the story like the Titanic and the suffragettes seem f like further clumsy and rather patronizing attempts to educate the reader there's also a surprising amount of sex in the book for a novel set in Victoria London uh, I don't have a problem with that but much of it was so gratuitous and the constantly repeated euphemisms such as sw soft peach honeypot and her hard piece at the top eventually had me rolling my eyes because I, could, I couldn't make uh, take, couldn't take any more of what sounded like a farcical pastiche of a badly written piece of erotic fiction. Um, but uh, so basically, yeah, it sounds as if Elisa Silverstone's dad uh, basically wrote himself a porn novel and then got his mates to review it on Goodreads and, you know, paid for like stock images to be put on the cover. And now he's like, if you look this guy up, he's like, yes, acclaimed author, Monty Silverstone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he's not wrong. He has yeah. some acclaim. It doesn't yeah. say it's good or bad. <laughs> Just a claim. I do want to see one of those one-star reviews was written by someone called Alicia S. I don't know uh, <laughs> who, 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 that, who that turned out to be. But. I have no idea. Could be anyone. <laughs> I mean, the only true acclaimed novelists are the people who wrote the guides for how to play WF Warzone on the N64. I mean, that's, that's the only real acclaimed novelists that I consider. It's the most perfect literature ever released. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, because you needed to know the moves for that game. It wasn't oh, you like definitely a, did. a modern one. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. You had to know the combinations. You could get them on the pause list, but come on, if you're, if you're fighting with your friends, you've got to just look down at the guide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Worth every penny of the nine ninety nine you had to pay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, to be honest with you, we didn't get into the whole uh, Alicia Silverstone's father, Jury Nazif, and I think that's because he doesn't have an even uh, like an entry on Wikipedia. So, so, no, um, no. I wasn't going to go looking around to see what he did. It just said he was a real estate agent, and I was like, okay, I can live with that as an idea. Alfred walks in doing uh, a okay. We were wrong all along, Nile. He made it. It's something though. He had to like pull the drip out of his own arm. He's coming in like yeah. blood, <laughs> <laughs> just pulling at his ankles. <laughs> well, he's he's angry. So I think I think he did. He he's, he's got up. He's not really angry. He's pretending. He's yeah. pulled them out of his arms. I thought he's fuming. The house is a pigsty. What are you That's doing? Really impressive too. He would. Uh, did he come down the stairs? Like how long are they? Like have they been sitting in the living room just hearing like. Ugh. <laughs> all the way down the steps shuffling like, <laughs> don't, don't, don't anyone help him don't anyone help him he's got to do it on his own he's got his pride yeah how, yeah, how old was he in this breath. film by this point I think he would have been like 80, 82 or something like he was he was well up there <laughs> but, but he looks older than that yeah, yeah and I don't mean that as an insult to him mm. he's, yeah, he's, you know he's, uh, he's had a life 
1916. So yeah, yeah. So so yeah. So 96 would have been 80. Yeah. Yeah. So he's 81. Mm. Tell you what, you know, keeping that in mind, plus how ill he's been, Bruce, uh, don't make this guy clean up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> we know bruce from the other movies he's gonna make him clean up don't oh, yeah. do it now that's a, that, that is the you know after, after the end of the next minute after they do their little you know handshake deal it's gonna be like so alfred uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's there's these pizza boxes everywhere <laughs> <laughs> i mean like uh, you know you can free to have the remaining slices but there are three or four days old so <laughs> oh. put them in the fridge sir <laughs> Alfred, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't know where the fridge is. So yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't even know what a fridge is. <laughs> but I tell you something that is really nice. Yet again, he calls Bruce son. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That is that is nice. Because he didn't. Weird enough, we were saying it seems I have memories like in a kind of what do you call it the um, mandala effect. I could have swore he called him son earlier in the movie, but like... Oh, wait, that's why I'm thinking uh, yet again, is why I'm saying that, isn't it? Because we talked about it, yeah. Yeah, it really seems like he's, a, he's just saying, I love you too, son. And then he it, it, it cuts before he says son. Like, what the hell? But uh, yeah, he does hear. And it's, um, it is nice too, because it's uh, as going through, like, you know, as credits starts to get passed around. You know, it was Bruce who came to talk to Mr. Freeze into giving the cure and stuff. And, you know, as Batman stopped the whole campaign of freezing the city and stuff like that. But it's, um, I was just surprised too after, it's a, it's a nice bit of character growth, I guess, from Robin. After a whole movie where he's just like, me, 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 what about me, 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 Bruce? The fact that he's just like, you know, good job, Bruce. You did it. Like, yeah. And then Bruce has to be like, you too. <laughs> and that was like, what do you do? <laughs> like, you didn't do anything. <laughs> the closest thing Robin came to being proactive and actually achieving something in this movie was when he went undercover with the rubber lips to poison Ivy. But then if Robin hadn't been around, there would have been no need for all that. There wouldn't have, Bruce wouldn't have all the animosity of them fighting throughout the whole movie and stuff. And I'm pretty sure he could have just done the rubber lips thing himself. So Yeah, why not? Yeah. yeah. And like, Robin, like, everything he does is like, even when he saves Batgirl's life, you know, the friggin' rope snaps, and then she has to save his life. So it's kind of like, well, he didn't really... He, he just he was in Batman forever. He didn't do anything. And in this movie, he doesn't do anything either. It's just like, he's a very frustrating character. But then, to be fair to Bar- Batgirl, when she steps in, everything she's saying is like, oh, that's 100% correct. Because she just had her moment of like, well, excuse me, I'm, I'm the one who kicked Ivy's botanical butt. Oh, botanical was- butts? I love that. <laughs> And it reminded me a little bit of like, you know, because cause all my friends have, you know, little kids now. And it, it, it couldn't, I couldn't help but get reminded of like when they're trying to show off like a little kid. Because you always hear them doing like, I did it all by myself. <laughs> it's like, no. But her being like, I did it all by myself. <laughs> it's like, Well, okay. she is meant to be kind of childlike, I suppose. Yeah. And Bruce giving a little pat in the head like, yeah, it was good. Good job, kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bruce and Dick as well uh, have yet another extraordinarily homoerotic moment mm. I think because um, Dick says to him when I fell off the telescope why didn't you try and save us it's the first time I've fallen and you weren't there to catch me yeah. it's like oh <laughs> and Bruce is like I've, mo- I've moved on Dick <laughs> oh no yeah it's like I was busy it- doing other stuff Jesus Christ you were fully grown adults sort things out <laughs> <laughs> well he does have a really good comeback i think you know he, he thinks dick could handle it and says that you know sometimes counting on somebody else is the only way to win bruce is growing as a person well it's like doing he's throwing dick's own words back at him because that's when that's what dick said to him earlier yeah, in the movie. It, he's not meant to be throwing them back at him it's meant to be like i've learned from you yeah yeah this is very <laughs> much like i've taken on board what you said and yeah yeah I Whereas a, a lot too. of the times in these movies i know the comics are different but batman wouldn't do that yeah, yeah. I got I mean, like comic Batman wouldn't ever say that because <laughs> he would he would never admit that he would just sort of silently do something to indicate he knows that yeah, Dick was right yeah. or something. But the, you'd never the, flat the out good, admit it. Uh, my favorite Bat Batmen are the ones who 
are a bit less um, open to working with people. And the, I, once Batman's inviting like twenty people to the cave, it, I'm I'm lost a little bit there. Well, this is this is not the minute for you, then, John. Well, no, this is this inner circle. You know, what I mean, in some of the comics, like every superhero in the goddamn planet is there with him. Why is this whole business now Batman Incorporated? Yeah, and there's just like he's just like he's just the sponsor of a Batman in every street or something. It's like what, what is happening here? This is this is not the Batman I signed up for, but. Talking about Chris O'Donnell, um, I was trying to think, have I seen him in any other films since this at the cinema? Uh, oh, at the I, cinema? Oh, I, probably not. I saw him in Max Payne in 2008. Hey. Oh, you went to the cinema for Max Payne? Yeah, I did. I got a bunch oh. of kids kicked out because they're all talking in front of me. There's about 12 of them. <laughs> you know, I fully support that. Got I don't all, care. Got them all kicked out. Had security come in. They stood. Security stood there. And then as soon as they started talking again, kicked them all out. Cleared, yes. the whole, cleared the whole row in front of me. Um, that was probably the most memorable thing that happened whilst I was watching <laughs> Max Payne. Um, and that's it. I like. I, it's good that um, you know Hollywood realised that they don't need Chris O'Donnell, and he hasn't starred in a film that went to the cinema since like 2010. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you know, they were like, he's, he's, he's got an NCIS. He's he's yeah. Fine. They're like <laughs> he's... You're, you're a TV star. Uh, do that. Um, he yeah. was he was in he was in uh, Grey's Anatomy as a vet. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. For like nine episodes, he was competition to McDreamy. Yeah. Um, I think and- I don't want to. I don't mean this as a diss because he's you know much more talented than me. But I think that's that's his level. That's that's fine. Yeah. yeah. How many other actors have started off in big movies that you like? They ended up realizing because nowadays you can go back and forth between TVs and movies because TV now is like it's the golden age and all this stuff and people. Like, no, more not Chris O'Donnell. Chris O'Donnell can't go back and forth between TV and <laughs> <Yeah>. movies. <laughs> he's, he's almost like the. I remember when you know the lead up to Batman Begins. One of the rumored castings was David Morianas as Batman, and I was like, "That guy, he's not, he's not got the chops to play like that." Yeah, they just think his angels brooding. Yeah, but it's like he's a he's a tease TV, like he's yeah. a TV actor. Not offense to him, but he's like David Morianas isn't a movie star, and yeah, so he never did jump into like you know an attempt with, with Valentine or whatever called it, but. Chris O'Donnell seems like this is a guy now that never should have got into the big leagues, but then eventually found his way down to like, oh yeah, the, the, you yeah network television. That's you you shine there, buddy. Like you can just 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 stay put now. <laughs> don't uh, don't be thinking you're gonna get popping up in the Flash or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know what? Again, not it's not an insult because it I couldn't do what he's doing. Yeah, I'd be yeah, terrible. But... I'd be terrible. But yeah, you know, you not not everyone's cut out for. Being the sort of the, the second in a huge superhero franchise, yeah, yeah. Plus, yeah. Too, once you get once you get like an NCIS or something, it's basically like having tenure. Yeah, it's like, yeah. It's they never free get money. rid of any. Yeah, just never get rid of anybody. <laughs> it's just like no, you'll be the show will go on forever, and you will always be here. So <laughs> it's like <laughs> over here in England, you know, getting a part on EastEnders or Coronation Street. I mean, they might yeah. kill you off, but they'll just bring you back anyway somehow. But, um, I mean, you mentioned the botanical butt line, uh, but Bruce here is adamant that, hey, you've got to go back to school anyway. Shush, Babs. Well, I'll also say, too, fair play to Barbara, because everything she's saying is 100% true. Like, it's like, because mm-hmm. you think, oh, Bruce could pop in with, like, well, technically you're in my a bat suit that, you know, comes from my money, and it was, like, gadgets that I created or whatever. But everything, the way she beat Poison Ivy, she didn't use any gadgets. Nope. She did. She literally did it all by herself. She could have been wearing her Wranglers on a checkered shirt, and she the same outcome would have happened. Like she still would have beat Poison Ivy. So it is actually fair enough. It's like actually, yeah, this this random lady who you know knows a little bit of New Jitsu or whatever because R- London's kind of rough. <laughs> Managed to take down, you know, the the mystery of how Poison Ivy is defeated in this thing will, will live with me to the day I die. <laughs> like, <laughs> but to be fair to her, yeah, 100% right. Like, those two guys were tangled in the vines, and she came in, didn't need a goddamn thing, didn't need one bat gadget, and managed to take down that well, lady, so. she is totally right. I agree. She is. But something I do not agree with is Dick saying to him, you're never going to win this argument. Because I'm thinking, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. She did save the day. But she should go and finish her studies, then come and be back, girl. Mm. Or at the very, very least, can't she, like, transfer to Gotham for uni? Yeah. You think, well, I wonder, too, could she get back in at Oxbridge? Because it'd be Bruce Wayne going, like, well, this is my, not ward, 
but she's like, well, it's, you know, here's the Wayne Foundation will will give you, you know, a uh, an airport or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oxbridge Academy could use an airport, Mr. Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It is particularly poorly served, I would say, uh, Oxbridge. It's very hard to. There's no real good transport links to it. <laughs> well, they want to keep it exclusive. That's why. Yeah, mostly to keep the pores out. Uh, exactly. That is that's the main reason. You know, they don't want still, the likes of me going there. It's, I mean, it, it also is very, you know, a cycling city. So, you know, maybe uh, maybe you could buy her a bike uh, uh, yeah, so she could yeah. get around while she's there. And, of course, the very real place of Oxbridge. <laughs> I'm assuming, though, even when she got in, though, the people of Oxbridge must have known that, like, well, her her uncle is, uh, you know, the butler to Bruce Wayne. So maybe that did give her a bit of sway coming in or whatever. But I don't know. I'm, I'm going to guess whoever the butler to Elon Musk is isn't getting into any exclusive, like, you know... <laughs> You know, I I don't know necessarily working for a rich person means you're getting paid well. I mean, plus I imagine his is, his have all died from brain chips and yeah, like, <laughs> like the monkeys and the piles of monkey corpses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, science can only move forward on heaps of monkey bodies, John. Be honest. I mean that. I mean, how else? I mean, that's exactly what Charles Darwin did. Was he was out there killing monkeys left, right, and center? You've got to do it for science. There's no other way to find stuff out. To be honest with you. Uh, uh, to be honest as well, he was eating half of them. Yeah, that was, a, that was his quote on the beagle. Was I they can't are, wait to eat that monkey. <laughs> they are very tasty. They're like uh, they're like Galapagos turtles, which like we knew existed for a hundred years, but not a single one managed to get back to England because the sailors would eat them because the turtle meat was <laughs> yeah, so tasty. They were just eating them all. Yeah. <laughs> They were like, go and get us a couple of Galapagos turtle turtles. And they'd be like, okay. And they'd stick them on the boat. And then like the voyage is so long, they'd be like, I've heard these are nice. And they'd end up just eating them. And they'd be like, okay. Literally took like 100 years just to get one Galapagos, Galapagos turtle over this here. Just fall to their knees sobbing. Like, I couldn't help myself. Yeah. Yeah, imagine like, coming wouldn't... back after like a five-year voyage and like, oh, where is it? Oh, we got hungry on the way. <laughs> yeah, it's like, we, well, we started the voyage with 140 turtles. And we finished the voyage with 140 shells. So if you need a shell... <laughs> I, yeah, so I, I don't know that, like, being the daughter of a butler of a famous guy is really going to be enough to... He's not even mm. a butler, really, is he? He's, he's, a, he's not managing the, the, a household. There's nobody yeah, else there. Yeah, essentially, for all intents and purposes, Alfred is Bruce Wayne, because he's the guy yeah. organizing everything for him. He's the man <laughs> so, of the house. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think like, the, the, like, the portrayal that you have of him in, um, uh, you know, Michael Caine in Dark Knight, I think he's probably the best Alfred, because... He he's he. It's obvious that he's the one arranging all the stuff to make it look like he's a playboy, and yeah, cover yeah. him for Batman and stuff. And it feels like this Alfred would be like, oh yeah, he's out, you know, partying with the, uh, I, I I don't know, and like name somebody who's been dead to ten years, and everyone would be like, um, <laughs> okay, I, I I guess I guess that's okay. Yeah. All, right <laughs> you know? all our interactions, though, he was pretty bad at lying in Batman Returns, where you just seemed yeah. to be like silly. Like, you know, dealing with Bruce and Selena and he always had this sort of like kind of like a little bit flustered about it and yet, yeah every other interaction I've ever seen it just seems like this Alfred is just snobby that's how he gets away with it like people would ask him what Bruce Wayne's up to and he'd just be like well he's very busy you know and he'd just walk away as if I hadn't got the time to tell you like that that's how he's been getting away with it it's like yeah, his butler seems to be an asshole and I don't really want to talk to him because he seems to be looking down his nose at me the whole time I mean obviously within the franchise this is I like this is the second most amount of comic book appearances after what's his face in the Superman films playing Jimmy Olsen I would think isn't it Mark McClure did like four of those yeah yeah and he did five technically because he did Supergirl. So he, up until this point, Mark McClure probably had the tenure for the longest amount of comic book appearances in the franchise. Mm. And then Michael Goff is beating that. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Robert Downey Jr. had to come in, wreck it for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I find it because obviously this film is like effectively the last, like, the, you know, the first Marvel film comes out a year after this with Blade. So mm. this is a, and obviously this killed the franchise. You know, yeah. only took only took them eight years. Only took them eight years to go from the most profitable franchise to the least profitable franchise. Good going. That's, that's an achievement. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It does feel as if like there's such a massive contrast. If yeah. you told me like twenty five years had passed between movies, I'd be like, oh, that seems right. But yeah, yeah eight years to go from eighty nine to this is like that is a roller coaster. <laughs> and and the just... thing is as well, it killed it off so efficiently that it took them another eight years before they even attempted a Batman film. <laughs> so 
you know, if you can kill a franchise off for the length it takes before they even bother to try and do a sequel. Although, obviously, Superman died longer, didn't it? Like, Superman was gone from, what, 87 to... Yeah. 2013? Yeah. Six, I guess, would be Superman Returns. So, oh, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I always forget yeah. that film because, yeah. you it's know. It's very, very forgettable. Very forgettable, yeah. So yeah. That's, that's what, like 19 years? That's uh, longer than that. Yeah. 22 years between. That's, like, a, that's, that's impressive. I can't do math. Like, I don't know what's going on here. I, I <laughs> didn't. That's, that's always the thing, though, because people always say this killed, like, not just, you know, DC, but they're always like, oh, yeah, I killed the comic book movie. But they're always like, oh, yeah, it was gone for so long. But it's like, well, you know, Blade, I'll see the next year. And then they're like, well, X Men started again. And it's like, yeah, so X-Men. that's three yeah, years you, later. That's that's not a death. <laughs> like, that's like, it was. Yeah, was, no, I'm, well, yeah, you had Blade 98, then you had X Men 2000, then you had Spider Man 2002. Yeah. And then that's it. You know, the boom begins. Hasn't stopped mm. for 20 years. <laughs> like, yeah. You know. So when people always give this thing, it's like, oh, it just destroyed a whole franchise, like a whole industry. Uh, like, I mean, I'd say technically, uh, really. I say technically, yeah, because Blade, although it was successful, it was successful for an R rated film. It wasn't successful for a normal film. You know, it made a lot of mm. money, but compared to, you know, other films that were out that year, it didn't make a huge amount. And even X Men, that was, you know, fairly low budget because they didn't think it would make that much money. And it didn't make a huge amount of money. Like it made enough that it, like, doubled or tripled its budget, but it it wasn't like a huge blockbuster. It was, you know, it wasn't until X2 that you had like an X Men film that was gigantic in terms of box office. And that came after Spider Man. And when Spider Man mm. opened, it broke every single record. It broke every record that Batman had set. It broke every record that. You know, Twister had set and Mission Impossible. Whatever films had set box office records for openings, it broke them all. And that's mm. so technically speaking, yeah, it took until like 2002 really before comic book movies were like gigantic crossover hits. Um, mm. You know, so you could you could make the argument, but five years is nothing now, is it? Like what's you know, <laughs> like a couple <laughs> of small comic book films in in the five year gap, like. Yeah, you know, you got like mystery men and stuff in between as well, I guess. But like that yeah. was, of course, not mystery men lost money. <laughs> I didn't make yeah, any money yeah. at all. I saw that in cinema, but it didn't make yeah. any money. Um, yeah, no, oh, of course, of course. But uh, but yeah, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm all noted out for this minute. Um, usually, Dan, we would ask you know at the end about uh, the guests, you know, worst movie they've ever seen, plus the movie that they love the other people but you kind of said earlier you you put up your choices uh earlier in recording of uh for just the, for the tom Ho- yeah basketball i've seen that i mean dozens of times and i'm Did sure we talk pe- about that off mic oh it might have been off mic oh, it might have been before recording it was, oh yeah so Darren, uh what's the worst <laughs> movie you've ever seen <laughs> and uh what movie do you like that uh, everybody else hates <laughs> i mean i like basketball but I know some people hate it. I mean, the thing is, I like I like loved uh, Wild Things. Like literally, I saw that opening Friday, um, and people are like, "Oh, it's like trashy or whatever." But I've seen all three sequels, and they're all equally as dumb. Um, <laughs> but none of them have like none of them could be good called good films. Um, but yeah, you know, like I mean, I'm, I mean, Batman and Robin probably was the worst film that I saw in 1997 in a year that included Spice World and Alien Resurrection. Um, <laughs> But I mean, I've, you know, uh, I went to the cinema the other day and it, it like since 1996, it was my 2200th film that I've seen at the cinema. Oh my God. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, that's like tickets really. I've, I've done some films more than once, like Dark Knight Rises, which I saw eight times at the cinema. So, you know, I've seen films more than once at the cinema, but yeah, I've seen a couple of thousand films at the cinema. Um, and I like, uh, I don't know, I don't know if it's me, but I, I just like sitting in the cinema and watching films. <laughs> so, I, I kind of will watch anything. I mean, I did see Cliff of the Big Red Dog before Christmas with my mom and my niece. Um, and like, I'm sure some people will be like, oh, that's a terrible film. But I'm like, you know, it was fine. Like, it's, it's like rare that a film like enrages me to the point where it's really bad. You know, yeah. um, I mean, you know, some people like hated uh, like Watchmen. Um, and I saw that film in the cinema and I was like, I mean, it's a bit long, but, you know, there's a I'm giant a blue fan, dong in so it. So I get yeah, it. Yeah. So like, you know. Well, you can't go wrong with a giant blue dong, can you? I mean, you know. <laughs> um, so we will head off now to the dark, dark night. Would you like to tell people where you can be found online or promote any shows you have? What is the upload date for this? So I can... Uh, it'll be like three or four weeks time, I think, at this point. Okay. Can you narrow it down? Because I've got very specific... Uh, no, I have no, I no. Have no specific dates. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can find me on Twitter at my name, but also at the moment I am doing uh, going through all of Tom Hanks's films. 
Um, and I think around the time this comes out, I'll probably be either on Captain Phillips or Saving Mr. Banks. Uh, one of, one of those. Um, you know, part of, I was, I, there's actually like a streak of films I actually saw at the cinema from Toy Story 3 to Bridge of Spies of Tom Hanks' films. Um, so we're kind of in the thick of that. Um, but yeah, you know, you can listen to my opinions on The Polar Express. Not a good film. Uh, Lady Killers. Not a good film. But everything else, really good. Like, you know, um, I mean, I, I mean, I guess apart from maybe Larry Crown. When I saw Larry Crown at the cinema, I was the only person in the cinema, so I thought that film flopped. Turns out the film made money. I just saw it on a day when nobody else did. Oh, so. you just got there on a weird, a weird yeah. day. Yeah, I thought, oh, this didn't make any money. No, it did. Uh, yeah, but that thing you do didn't make any money, but Larry Crown did. That's the world we are living in, yeah. So you can find us on Twitter somehow. I can never remember the Twitter handle for that because it's very awkward. Well, cool. Check all of that out, everybody. And as usual, come and speak to us on all, all the usual. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Look us up there. And we will be back next time with Minute 120. And a new guest. Ooh, who will it be? See you then, Batmites. Next time, teamwork makes the dream work. A case is made for an addition to the cave, as three crusaders combine their claws, and a climactic quote is cribbed from Jaws. It's a merry end for our masked manhunters and their smiling major domo, but what further adventures await this truly triumphant trio? A signal shines brightly on Friday, bat fans. Same bat pod, different bat minutes. We'll be, be back. back. <laughs> <laughs>